Hi, everybody. Good evening. My name is Marjorie Schuster, coordinator of literary events here at the Temple Emanuel Stryker Cultural Center. And I am very, very proud to welcome you to a very important program and to hear from some very special guests. This issue, of course, unfortunately, could not be more timely. Over the past few weeks, we've heard with alarm rising hate speech. We watched the appearance of SWAT stickers in public places, death threats against Jewish students. It cuts through our comfortable world here in New York, in America. We used to think that anti-Semitism was just a fringe sentiment, but this, things are getting frightening. All of this, of course, is just a tiny glimpse to what um, people all over Europe went through during the Holocaust. Not just the Nazi brutality, but the realization that their neighbors were anti-Semites and were more than happy to collaborate. Which brings us to this evening's event. This is the theme that author Naomi Reagan explores in her latest novel, her 13th, called The Enemy Beside Me. And it's around which Dr. Ephraim Zuroff, who's chief Nazi hunter for the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Tel Aviv, has built so much of his life. We are very proud and very happy they're joining us this evening from Israel in a conversation moderated by Melvin Jules Bouquet, a faculty member of Sarah Lawrence and editor of the Holocaust anthology, Nothing Makes You Free. First, we're going to show clips from the film Jay Accuse. It's about 15, 20 minutes. It could be a little rough, but it's a very important film, and then they're going to discuss it afterwards. So the film is about to begin, and uh, thank you for joining us. Was this woman, this man at the edge of the death pit, these schoolgirls forced to strip naked before their killers, we shall never know. Their Lithuanian tormentors stole everything from them, their families, their histories, their lives, and their voices. This film will be their voice. How do we, the Jews of Lithuania, tell our story? How do we describe our 600-year-old community, a gem of the Jewish exile? How to reveal our historic contribution to both Torah study and modernity. Are there words to describe the cruelty of our slaughter without parallel, even in Holocaust Europe? We'll start our story with the birth of two Lithuanian children. A boy and a girl. Justice itself demands that we, the murdered, tell you about the cruelty of our killing. Nowhere in Holocaust Europe was the slaughter of Jews more depraved than in Lithuania. The terror descended in three stages. The slaughter began as soon as the Soviets left. Lithuanian nationalists went on the rampage even before the Nazis arrived. This was slaughter at its most theatrically depraved. Mass rape, dismemberment, beheadings, the lopping off of noses, ears, sexual organs, the gouging of eyes, the splitting apart of pregnant women, the murder of children in front of their parents. All of this happened everywhere. The second phase saw deportations and imprisonments. But these two were done with a careful cruelty, the purpose of which was to dehumanize us as a necessary prelude to murder. Entire communities robbed, incarcerated and starved, often in our own defiled synagogues. Synagogues were often set on fire, murdering everyone. 
The third stage was mass murder by the gun, generally organized by the Nazis, but carried out almost entirely by thousands of willing Lithuanians. 70,000, our brothers and sisters from glorious Vilna, butchered in the Ponadi forest. 30,000 from Kaunas, and 11 people, perhaps all one family, from the tiny lost shtetl of Kvedarna. This Lithuanian orgy of knives, clubs, fists, axes, fire, boots and bullets was the most successful in Holocaust Europe. When it was over, and there were no more Jews left to kill, 96.4% of our ancient community, as many as 220,000 men, women and children, were dead. Lithuania, you have tried to forget, and who can blame you? But largely thanks to this remarkable man, we know what happened. Leib Konyachovsky was an engineer from Kaunas. When the Jews of his town were rounded up, he escaped and spent four years hiding in a disused farm building. From 1945 to 1947, Konyachovsky searched for witnesses in the shattered towns, shtetls, and DP camps of Europe. He was able to collect 121 eyewitness testimonies, each paragraph a memoir of horror. These testimonies are absolutely horrific to read. There is nothing like this that I've read anywhere else in the history of the world. The brutality that Lithuanians displayed was beyond anything in history. And we, the defenseless Jews of Plunga, did not escape his horror. Kevin Amol is a shtetl, Bambrek fun nester in tol. Ein gewicht in chaloimes, Kevin as a shtetl Amol. Among the reported atrocities of the following, Scores of our young girls, violently snatched from home and dragged into the woods for rape parties, after which they were literally chopped to pieces. Another group of 75 schoolgirls who were cynically converted to Catholicism with the promise that they would be spared the bullet, but were then murdered along with everyone else. There were murder dances, and dozens of other deadly humiliations. But the worst atrocity was a macabre public entertainment that took place in full view of the whole town. On a hot summer's day in 1941, we, the Jews of Plunga, were violently evicted from our homes and imprisoned in our beautiful synagogue in the town center. Here it is, depicted on a Rosh Hashanah card just six years earlier. As many as 1,700 men, women and children were incarcerated in the synagogue for three weeks in the summer heat. Three weeks without water, food or care of any kind. Occasionally, Lithuanian thugs would murder another Jew, then throw the corpse back into the synagogue. Inside, we were dying. A first, hunger, murder. Amid the human waste, bodies began to decompose. On the 15th of July, the wretched survivors were transported to the nearby forests and butchered. To save bullets, babies and small children were buried alive, or their skulls were smashed against trees. This was common throughout Lithuania. This was the man in charge, Jonas Noreika. So before I uh, left Lithuania, I got a strange call 
And he says, I'm just calling to say that I'm sorry more of the country's leaders didn't come. And I said, okay, why didn't they come? And he said, because of the Jews. And I said, what could the Jews say? And he just sighed. I could just hear him sigh. And the more Lithuanians I started talking to about this, it's like a lot of Lithuanians knew that my grandfather was involved, heard the rumor that he was involved in killing Jews. Um, so it's like this open secret that everybody knew except me, it seemed. I was convincing myself that it is just communist propaganda. I come back to Chicago and I talk to my father and, you know, other people. And I'm like, have you heard this crazy rumor about my grandfather killing Jews? And like, yeah, we heard it. I'm like, what? Like, this is common knowledge. Like, lots of people have heard this and I've never heard this. And I said, how come nobody ever told me? And they're like, well, it's not true. Why would we talk about it? It's just communist propaganda. Okay. So, um, I went to denial for more than, uh, for about 10 years. I don't know the exact date, but it was about, about 10 years. It took me a long, long time uh, to accept this, that this was really true. P part of the process in accepting it was deciding that I wanted to continue with the story. Because at this point, I felt the weight of the world on my shoulders. And I was all alone doing this. And I just knew already that if I continue with this book, I was going to disgrace Lithuania. And it was one of the turning points for me psychologically, internally, to decide to still go ahead and do it. I'm doing this for the love of Lithuania. Because if it's the truth, you have to face it. And I feel like this, this is the patriotic thing to do. This is what it means to be a patriot of Lithuania. Because if we don't face this, and if Lithuania doesn't face this, it cannot become healthy and strong and move forward with grace. For 33 years, Grand Goshen has been fighting the Lithuanian government through the courts. He has concentrated on the government's exoneration of Holocaust mass murderers, especially Jonas Noreka. Principally, his battle has been directed against what many call the Lithuanian government's lie factory. The Genocide and Resistance Research Center, known as the Genocide Center. Lithuania's Genocide Center is a government agency that is supposed to report on human rights atrocities in Lithuania. Instead, it is an Orwellian propaganda center set up to rewrite the history of Lithuania into a fraudulent narrative to glorify the state. It is a center of Holocaust revisionism. It is a center of historical fraud. They employ over a hundred people they have a museum on which they engrave outside the names of Holocaust perpetrators and glorify Holocaust perpetrators as their national heroes and rewrite the national narrative in order to exonerate Holocaust perpetrators of their crimes. And how does the Genocide Center deal with Noreka? They conclude that Jonas Noreka was a rescuer of Jews. That he stole everything we owned, drove us into the ghettos, and starved us in the synagogues before dispatching us to murder pits to protect us. The insult is aggressive as it is crude. It was the Genocide Center who was the big engine 
behind resurrecting my grandfather and bringing him to that heroic status. They're the ones who are defending him. It calls itself the Genocide Center, but the actual genocide that occurred in Lithuania has not been thoroughly studied. The Germans did not hurt the Lithuanians during the Nazi occupation. They gave them guns to fight against the communists, which really was to kill the Jews. Just an euphemism. It was all a euphemism to kill the Jews. And what they like to call the genocide is what happened to Lithuanians by the Soviets. Um, and it's not equal. So it feels like a genocide to Lithuanians, that they were sent to Siberia, that they were um, occupied for 50 years. It feels like a genocide, maybe spiritually. But guess what? Their bodies are still breathing and they're alive. Maybe they're psychologically damaged, but they're still alive. I think the Jews who were killed would have preferred that if given a choice. Every one of Grant Goshen's 35 legal actions against the Genocide Center has been rejected by the Lithuanian courts on narrow technical grounds. At no stage has the substance of his case the government's deliberate covering up of mass murder been considered. Unfortunately, I have discovered that there is total collusion between the Genocide Center, the government, the courts, and the public prosecutor. They work with one mind. Generally in Lithuania, even when I was there, they would be, somebody would be like, well, where did you get that from? And I would name the title and they're like, that's a Jewish book. I'm like, oh, what does that mean? And they're like, well, you can't trust that because it's a Jewish book. It was written by a Jew. The Genocide Center has lots of paid historians who could have all figured this out too, if they wanted to, but they didn't want to. I say shame on you to the historians in Lithuania who could have done this Uh, but didn't. At the same time, I understand that they couldn't do it because they would have lost their jobs. If, even if they tried, and if there were those who did try, and they did lose their jobs. The government of Lithuania intimidates and silences those that oppose them. In 2015, 19 of their leading intellectuals wrote a letter asking the government to remove the honors for Noreka. The government responded, these are agents of the East, meaning Kremlin agents, Jews, and other stupid people. The closest thing that I can compare the Lithuanian Genocide Center to is a university in Pyongyang in North Korea, where they teach the greatness of the great leader. It is that level of propaganda of dishonesty and ideology. For Sylvia Foti, the cruelty of her grandfather's regime was profoundly traumatic. I have heard stories where Jews ran from Lithuanians to the Germans, asking for Germans for help from the Lithuanians. And for me to be part of that, at least by heritage and blood, is so painful. I, I want to disassociate myself from it. The other two personal items of family history are especially painful to Sylvia. The first is this photograph of a party in Blunga, taken two weeks after the massacre. So in the picture were a uh, hundred Lithuanians from Plunga in like five, seven rows, standing, the sun is in their eyes, and it's a afternoon, and there, my, my father, my grandfather was there, my grandmother was there, my mother was in the lap of my grandfather's sister, Antonella. 
and it took me a long time to, to piece this together. This is why it took me, you know, I, in 2013, I didn't connect this yet. But later as I'm writing the story, five, you know, through those five years and I'm putting this together, I'm like, son of a gun. They had a party after all these 2,000 Jews were, like half the town went missing and they're having a party. And one of the stages of genocide is a celebration of the genocide. And so that's what that was. It's a celebration of the genocide. Although the Genocide Center, right, I put there, says, oh no, they were just celebrating getting rid of the communists. That was a, it, was no, it, was, it has nothing to do about killing Jews. The second are two grotesquely personal items looted by Nareka. There were like bookshelves, maybe like a mirror, some clothing. But there were also like these two nightcaps um, that people, I guess, used to wear on their heads to go to sleep, to stay warm. I have this image of him and my grandmother in bed wearing these nightcaps. And I think, how is this possible? And they were not the only two Lithuanians doing this. It is possible that every single Lithuanian home in Lithuania has some Jewish artifact. That is possible, and I wonder. Lithuania, you are a country blessed with heroes. Jonas Paulovicius is one. One August day in 1941, he saw a Jewish man shot in the street. This man was one of about 600 intellectuals murdered on that day just outside Kaunas. Paulovicius swore to devote his life to saving Jews. And together with his wife, Antonina, son Kestutis, and daughter Danute, saved 16 Jews. Neighbors and relatives only found out when the Russians arrived, and these pale, almost naked people emerged from their underground hideouts. And what happened to this hero? On May the 1st, 1952, he was shot in the head through an open window as he slept. The murder went unpunished. Jonas Paulovicius, his wife Antonina, son Kestutis, and daughter Danute are named Righteous Among the Nations by Israel's Yad Vashem, its highest possible honor. And the Republic of Lithuania? It awarded them the life-saving cross, its 22nd highest award. There were over 900 Lithuanian rescuers of Jews. Many of these magnificent people had family and friends who kept their dangerous secret and deserved to share their glory. Not one of these heroes has a statue in Lithuania. There are no roads named after them. No bridges. No parks. There are no schools named in their honor. But we shall remember these brave people until the end of time. And what of our murderers? What were their names? Thanks to this extraordinary man, we do have some idea. Joseph A. Malamud escaped the slaughter in Kaunas to fight with the partisans. He compiled this list of over 20,000 Lithuanian killers. Malamud's list was never officially published because of Lithuanian objections. A deal was apparently struck. The list would be suppressed until the Lithuanian scholars had done their own research. Their research was never done, so no names have ever been released. Where did our rapists, torturers and murderers go? Mostly they went west, to a town near you. When the Soviets were coming into Lithuania, the Lithuanian Holocaust perpetrators knew that the Soviets would punish them for their crimes. So many of the perpetrators 
went west. They declared themselves to be anti-Nazi, anti-communist, represented that they were victims, entered displaced persons camps, and came to England, Australia, the United States, and Canada. There were investigations in the United States. In one city block um, on the East Coast, 11 members of one killing unit lived near each other. Um, they gave each other cover. They, um, test they testified on behalf of each other and they escaped culpability. The Lithuanians that were captured by the US government, Lithuania resisted receiving them as deportees. And when they were returned to Lithuania, the Lithuanian government didn't punish them. The interim prime minister of Lithuania for the provisional government was named Brazaitis. Brazaitis, under any concept of law, was a Holocaust perpetrator. Like many of the Lithuanian Holocaust perpetrators, he escaped to the West and was reburied in the United States. In 2012, the government of Lithuania exhumed his remains and repatriated them to Lithuania to be reburied with full state honors. Outside historical organizations told the Lithuanian government that he was a Holocaust perpetrator. Internal Lithuanian historical associations told the government of Lithuania that he's a Holocaust perpetrator. The genocide center said he had been completely exonerated and rehabilitated by the US government. A completely dishonest statement. What it represents, they are willing to insult and demean the very members of Congress that are giving them NATO and US support. Their murderers are more important to them than the value of their state. Have we had any kind of justice? Has anyone been punished for these terrible crimes against us? Lithuania has not punished a single person that persecuted a Jew. Instead of, instead of punishing the murderers, they have named them as heroes. This is reflective of a national value system. My name is Yeshua Hessel Kretzmer. I was born in Birge in 1853. I want to tell you about how it was, the good times. Because Birge, Birge in glorious Yiddish, was a Gan Eden, a Garden of Eden. These are the Jews of my town. These are our beautiful children. We were part of this town. Almost 40% of the population, 70% of its businesses. There were six synagogues, three study houses for the Torah, four Jewish schools, many private cheders. We had welfare institutions, health clinics, old age homes, support funding for the unemployed. Youth movements flourished for every observant, secular and political preference. There were theatre companies, discussion groups, orchestras and bands. And the first football game ever played in Birger was between Maccabi and Hapoel. And every week we celebrated. Bar mitzvahs, weddings, Shabbat, the festivals, when candles and hope burned in every Jewish home. Then, almost overnight, the town turned on us, and we were no longer human. And on August the 8th, 1941, after a fortnight of humiliations, rapes, robbery and selective murders, we were marched to a tranquil forest grove, not a mile and a half from the town centre, and butchered. 2,400 men, women and children. Then, 
These are the names of our Lithuanian murderers. Fifty were our neighbors from Brige. The list includes a man called Kairos, infamous for his cruelty. The lawyers Ziava and Zovje. Chief of police Ignatovicius. And, most terrifyingly, 15-year-old students from the 8th class of the prestigious Lithuanian gymnasium in Birje. And how are we, the Jews of Birj, remembered today in Birje? We aren't. Inside the town's beautiful 500-year-old Sela Museum, there is barely a mention about our community who lived here for six centuries. We were exterminated in one day, not three kilometers from the museum itself. But we Jews are everywhere in Lithuania, even in the Birje Sela Museum. And today the museum is lucky. There is an important visitor, Riva Friedman from Israel. While visiting the museum today, happened to by chance come upstairs and to our surprise, we found an exhibition of clocks which had belonged or were made by my grandfather, my father's father, which is quite amazing to see this collection of clocks, glasses, and even the uh, a receipt, I presume it's a receipt of, uh, with his letterhead on it. I, I, don't, I don't have words to express how I feel. It's just so emotional. I didn't expect to find anything like this here. I, didn't expect, this was the last thing I expected to find. And it's just uh, blown me away. These beautifully made objects are evidence of a profound crime. They were robbed from this man, Riva Friedman's grandfather, Josef Rabino. Here he is with his family, standing proudly in front of his shop. His wife and children, and the wider family, all from my hometown, Birje. And of course, all these people were murdered and thrown into the pit. The museum knows this, because Riva Friedman has told them. But to this day, there is not a word of this deadly provenance. Secrets everywhere. In the Birger Museum, there is an absence of mention of Jews, because they don't want to call attention to the fact that it was Lithuanians that murdered the Jews in Birsh. They don't want people to know the facts. They want people to believe what they tell them to believe. Lithuanians generally think they're completely innocent of doing anything for the Holocaust, and that is their very firmly held belief system. They were just the victims. They were victimized by the Nazis and the communists. And they had nothing to do with killing Jews, it was all the Nazis. That is a very firmly held belief system. And here's me and others coming in to challenge that, and it upsets their whole identity. Um, so so this, this is changing the national narrative, and it's very traumatic. That's how Lithuanians are now. They're traumatized by this, and they don't know what to do about it, except to be enraged. They're enraged. Good evening, everyone. I don't know what I expected when I published The Enemy Beside Me, my 14th novel. And I think the most difficult, the most heartbreaking, the most infuriating, and maybe the most important book that I've ever written. I think I had a modest goal. I wanted to pull from obscurity hidden pockets of Holocaust distortion and anti-Semitism that have gone under Jewish radar until now. As Douglas Murray recently wrote, we can all become wanderers in a lost civilization if our memory goes. But what I certainly did not expect was that my book was going to be born into an all-out anti-Semitic genocidal war that has engulfed the entire world if not in practice, then in theory. A war supported 
not only by the usual suspects, the Ayatollahs and all of the Palestinian terror groups who keep changing their names, but they're all exactly the same, but by Harvard College professors, students at NYU and Cornell congresswomen, newscasters, journalists from respected mainstream media, that such is the case is absolutely flabbergasting. The enemy beside me, it seems to me now, is more important than I thought it was because vitally, it reminds decent people what happens to civilized countries taken over by mindless mobs fed by ignorance and prejudice and nourished by slogans instead of facts, violent temper tantrums instead of reason, it underscores how easily people can be manipulated to laud, support, and eventually participate in even the vilest and most unspeakable acts of barbarism in the name of some vague ideal. If urged by enough slick videos and surgically enhanced influencers wearing designer clothes, what things will young people today have the courage and the intelligence to reject? Not much, I'm afraid. The way once millions of ordinary people mesmerized by Nazi uniforms and insignia were complicit in the mass murder of millions. To a frightening degree, the lessons of the Holocaust have not been learned. They have not been internalized. Why did I decide to focus on Lithuania? Because Lithuania killed a higher percentage of Jews than any other country in Europe, including Nazi Germany. And they did it before the Germans even got there. But more importantly, because today, Lithuania is the leading proponent of Holocaust distortion in Europe, honoring the perpetrators and dishonoring the mass graves and seeking to create a new false narrative that will wipe out any gains that Holocaust education in Europe has achieved over the last 70 years. As much as all of us would love to put this terrible chapter of our history behind us, Reality makes that impossible. Now more than ever, we cannot remain deaf and blind to the dishonoring of our dead and the miseducation of the living, bestowing upon Lithuania, Latvia, Poland, and the Ukraine, in parentheses, the Palestinians too, um, the idea that these are enlightened people, Europeans who have learned from their past or have learned from history, and repented, this has to stop. This idea has to stop. The time has come to take a united stand against such stupendous, wrong-headed choices. As those of you who are familiar with my other novels probably realize, this book is not my usual subject matter, which is the lives of Orthodox women. But I am the daughter-in-law of survivors of Auschwitz and the Hungarian slave labor force and writing about the Holocaust was something that I've always felt I had to do at a certain point. Years ago, I even tried. I wanted to base it on my, uh, all the things that I had learned from my mother-in-law on Friday night. She used to tell me stories about what it was like when the Nazis came to her little town in Ungvar and picked her up, and she was 14 years old. And my father-in-law told us even less. But I couldn't write that book. I couldn't write that book because I didn't have enough information. And in order to get the information that I needed, I would have to, I would have to ask them to talk about things they just didn't want to talk about. And I, I felt that this was going to hurt them. So I backed off. I let that idea go. But that didn't mean that I stopped looking for answers. And from the time I was six years old, and I, was, I secretly listened in on an Auschwitz documentary that was playing in the living room and my mother wouldn't let me watch, 
from that moment on, I've been trying to understand, but really without much success. The Holocaust, says our moderator, who's sitting in the audience, um, Melvin Julius Bouquet, is a black hole that devours light. The more illumination you cast on it, the less you see. And then three years ago, during COVID, I happened to meet an old friend walking down a nearly deserted street in Jerusalem, Dr. Ephraim Zorov, head of Israel's Weizenthal Center and a renowned Nazi hunter. We stopped briefly to chat, and in those few minutes, he related some information that was so shocking that it really upended everything that I knew. He had co-authored a book with a best-selling Lithuanian author, Ruta Vinagata, a nonfiction book entitled Our People, a wonderful book, in which they detailed the almost unknown story of how local Lithuanian farmers, butchers, policemen, savagely and sadistically murdered and looted almost every man, woman, and child in the country. Over 96% of Lithuania's 600-year-old Jewish community and to this day, they have denied that it ever happened. And then Dr. Zurov told me this. Traveling around Lithuania, gathering information from local people, something extraordinary happened. He, who had spent his life seeking justice for Holocaust victims, who was the namesake of a great uncle that had been killed by Lithuanian perpetrators collaborating with the Nazis, had nevertheless managed to develop a friendship with Ruta, even though she was probably the child of perpetrators, a friendship that had deepened into love. In the aftermath, there had been hell to pay. Ephraim had faced criticism, and Ruta was dumped by her editor, her agent, her publishing house, her popular books were snatched off the shelves of bookstores. Her livelihood was depleted. She even faced physical attacks. Eventually, she had no choice but to leave the country. As an author, I was immediately struck by Ephraim and Ruti's remarkable journey, which would, it had the kind of complexity that lends itself to a full-length novel. For not only is it about irredeemable evil, but also about penitence and remorse and forgiveness and reconciliation. What separates The Enemy Beside Me from almost every other novel out there about the Holocaust is that it's about our generation. That's a subject that's really touched upon in Holocaust literature. And with that, it has the bonus of being a love story with deeply sympathetic protagonists whose relationship faces unbelievable challenges and obstacles, people you care about, you really want to succeed despite all of the impossible odds. And so I created the characters of the Israeli Nazi hunter, Milya Gottstein Lasker, and the Lith Lithuanian professor, Darius Vidas. And when Darius invites Milya to take part in a Holocaust education project in Lithuania, She's very skeptical about his sincerity, but yeah, given the country's history, she decides to come anyway because she has developed a secret and very subversive plan to circumvent official Lithuanian channels and use her platform to reveal to Lithuanian high school students the truth they have been, not, been denied concerning the history of what place, took place in their hometowns. Dr. Vitas warned he is putting his successful career in jeopardy by hosting her, defiantly takes the risk, believing himself to be the grandchild of a Lithuanian mayor who saved a Jewish family during the war. Milia and Darius's journey, like Zorov's and Vinagata's, begins with antagonism and irreconcilable differences, but ends in partnership as they battle mutual enemies that threaten everything they love everything they believe in and everything they hope to accomplish. What I, as a novelist, particularly wanted to explore in The Enemy Beside Me was how those characters cross that abyss which still divides our generation and our children's and our grandchildren. So many in the world today, Jew and non-Jew, struggle with the horrors that are the legacy of our history, especially now when we see how that history is being repeated. 
What can Ephraim and Ruth's story teach us about finding true reconciliation and even love without betraying our loyalty to the victims or the love of our birthplace? It is difficult, if not impossible, to write about things no one really understands and no one understands the Holocaust. Crimes before which the human imagination halts at the threshold, holding back before entering, frightened and disbelieving that our fellow human beings are capable of such things. And yet, the more we hold back, the more the voices of the victims fade, become unclear, distant, until they finally lapse into silence. If we allow that to happen, then the voices of the enemy still beside us will ramp up in volume, distorting beyond recognition the historical facts of the greatest crime in history. They've already begun the cacophony, rewriting history to obfuscate, excuse, distort, and lull us into acceptance. What they want us to believe is it wasn't so bad. It was a war. Everybody suffered, all these kinds of things. The Jews are not the only ones that this happened to. It happens in all wars. What they want us to do is to forget that there ever was a Holocaust. And this, all good people of the world must not allow. Thank you. Um, good evening. Uh, I'd like to, to give you the really historical background of, the, of Nomi's book, and uh, I think you'll understand what prompted her to try and take on the challenge of dealing with this issue of Holocaust distortion uh, through a novel uh, which brought together two people who couldn't come from different backgrounds, so different backgrounds, who started out as very suspicious about each other and ultimately joined forces to try and tell the truth about the Shoah. So I've been, I devoted basically my entire life to trying to bring to justice Nazi war criminals. I was the sole researcher of the, of the United States Justice Department's Office of Special Investigations in Israel for six years, and afterwards worked for the, with Simon Wiesenthal as their coordinator of Nazi war crimes research, and worked very hard to bring Nazis from all over the world uh, to justice. Now, when uh, the Soviet Union crumbled, uh, many of us assumed that these new democracies would adopt the accepted narrative of the Holocaust. But what we saw very, very soon after the, after the breakup of the Soviet Union was that that was a pipe dream. I'll give you a very good example. The site of the mass murder of the Jews of Vilna is a place called Ponar, or Panerai in Lithuanian. 70,000 Jews, mostly from Vilna, but not only from Vilna, were murdered there between 1941 and 1944. The Soviets created a, built a monument in Ponar, uh, which was like all the monuments throughout the Soviet Union, with the caption to the victims of fascism. Who are those victims? They don't say. Who are the perpetrators? They don't say. So at this ceremony, we expected, uh, so the Lithuanians, one of the things that they did do is to build a brand new uh, monument uh, with a clear statement that this is uh, done to the Jews. Uh, in four languages, in Lithuanian, in Russian, in, Russian, in Hebrew, and in Yiddish. And uh, the keynote speaker at the dedication was none other than the Prime Minister of Lithuania, Gereminas Vagnorius. 
And what he said was the following, that the misdeeds of a few criminal elements, marginal people, not really part of our society, cannot ruin the reputation of a country where so much was done to save our Jewish citizens. Very interesting. Where are all those Jewish citizens? They didn't leave Lithuania. They're six feet under in 234 mass graves of Holocaust victims in Lithuania. Now, my major focus in the beginning was to try and get Lithuanian Nazi war criminals who had run away to the United States, but had been stripped of their citizenship by the Office of Special Investigations and been deported to Lithuania, and almost all of them returned to Lithuania and were received in Lithuania, and they weren't sent to jail. But we, uh, we tried our best to try and put pressure on the government to bring these people to justice. And the sad story is that we only managed to get the Lithuanians to put three people on trial, two of them very important Nazi war criminals, Alexandros Lelekis and Kazyskim Gauskas, who were the commander and the deputy commander of something called the Saugumas. Lithuanian Saugumas in Vilna was a unit which had 100 people under Lelekis's, uh, uh, you know, under Lelekis, and their job was to guard the Vilna ghettos. There were two Vilna ghettos to guard them, to prevent Jews from escaping, to prevent those few Lithuanians, and there, are, there were several righteous among the nations in Lithuania, and we should never forget them, to, to attempt to help the Jews in the, video, in the ghetto, and they took the Jews to Ponar to be murdered. So the Lithuanians did everything possible to make sure that either these people would not be brought to justice, or even if they were brought to justice, they would not be punished. And in fact, not a single Lithuanian Nazi collaborator was, was punished in independent Lithuania. Although almost all those who were kicked out of the United States, the, the denaturalized and deported, went back home. And they were received, in some cases, even as, as heroes. Now, as time went by, it became clear to me that this was a futile effort. And as these people died off, without being punished, okay, this, the issue moved from the question of justice, of bringing them to, to court, making sure that they were punished, to this, what's the narrative? What is the truth about what happened in Lithuania? So all of a sudden, out of the blue, I was invited by Ruta Vanagaita, who is a very popular Lithuanian author, to come participate in a conference on Holocaust education. And I had no idea who she was, and uh, I hadn't been invited to speak in Lithuania, because I'm like the most hated Jew in Lithuania. I'm proud of that, I have to say. Um, so I decided to meet her, and what, one of the things she told me in the course of this conversation was that she admitted that her parents, not her parents, that her relatives, two of her relatives, her grandfather and her aunt's husband, had participated in the, in the murder of the Jews of Vilna. Uh, not Vilna, of Vilna, Lithuania. Now, I was t absolutely uh, shocked by that admission. I'd been coming to Lithuania for 20 years, came many, many times, had many press conferences, has many <laughs> fought these issues with the Lithuanians, and I never, ever was approached by anyone who told me that their relatives or even their friends had played any role in the mass murder of the Jews. And I, I knew the statistics. There were 220,000 Jews living in Lithuania under the Nazi occupation, of whom 212,000 were murdered. 90% of them 
right near their homes by shooting, and the majority of cases by, by Lithuanians. So basically, what I felt was, and Ruta made this very clear to me, she, she, she told me, you know, when we got independence, all of a sudden you arrived on the scene and you're telling us that we're mass murderers. You ruined the wedding celebration. So, so it, it was clear that she was correct. I mean, she brought that thing home to me. And I said to myself, you know, if they won't listen to me, a boy from Brooklyn with a kippah on his head coming from Jerusalem, then maybe they'll listen to Ruta Venegaita, who's one of the most popular authors in Lithuania. And we started talking and we decided we're gonna try and do something together. That something ultimately was a mission to go to 40 places of mass murder where Lithuanians murder Jews, 35 in Lithuania itself, and most people don't know this, but a Lithuanian unit, the second auxiliary police battalion was sent to Belarus where they murdered thousands and thousands of Jews in Belarus. So in other words, they didn't only, the Lithuanians didn't only murder their own Jews, they also murdered Jews in Belarus, and they also brought, the Nazis brought Jews from France, um, Austria, Czech Republic to Kovna, that's the guy that was the interwar capital of Lithuania, to be murdered at the Ninth Forts. And in other words, Little Lithuania was responsible for the murder of a quarter of a million Jews altogether. So we went on this mission. What we did was we interviewed people in these, who were living in these places, all non-Jews, because there were no Jews left in any of these places. And of course, the, question, the first question that we asked was, who, who, was, you know, who was involved in the murder of the Jews here? And all the witnesses, every single piece of person we interviewed had the same answer, the Lithuanians. So I just want to tell you one short little story about one case of a woman we met in a town in Svencioneli, or Novo Svenciani in Yiddish, a place right near where my grandfather was born. And uh, I saw her coming out of a grocery store, and I said to Ruta, listen, she looks like she's old enough to have lived during the Shoah. Ask her, ask her what she knows. So I don't speak Lithuanian, that's why Ruta had to do the talking, and Ruta asked her, no, what, do, what do you remember? And she told us the following story. Um, I was eight years old when the decrees against the Jews started. And I had a Jewish friend, a girl, and I was with a, in a family of two girls, just like our family. We were two girls, I was the younger sister, and I had an older sister. And when the decrees against the Jews began, we had a very intense discussion in our family whether or not we could save my friend, my Jewish friend. So I, I told Ruth to ask her, you probably, you probably were afraid of the Germans. She said, no. We could have hidden her forever from the Germans. We were afraid of our neighbors. And she started crying. And I'm telling you, I, 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 it was so touching. It was obvious that this was the first time she could talk about what had happened to her and her sorrow at the death of her, of her, of her friend, because no one else was, was interested, no one else gave a damn. And here, all of a sudden, two people come 70 years later, and she can tell someone who empathizes with her. So because Ruto was such a, a popular author, the book was published in Lithuanian, otherwise it never would have been published. Um, on the condition that we not tell anybody what we're writing about, what Ruth is writing about, uh, until the, the launch of the book. We launched the book in the headquarters of the Ipatinga Buris. The Ipatinga Buris was the special Nazi mur uh, Lithuanian murder squad that murdered the 70,000 Jews in Ponar. Today it's an Italian restaurant in the middle of Vilna. Any event, so Ruta, Ruta prepared a clip of seven places of mass murder in the vicinity of Vilna. 
the name of the place, the date of the murders, the number of the victims. It started with a slide 75 years ago, the Holocaust took place in Lithuania and ended with of 2,000, 200,000 Jews were murdered. The Lithuanians had a very important role. Now, the book has already come out in eight different languages, and it's had, a, it's had a, I have to say, an impact in certain segments of the Lithuanian population. What's particularly interesting is who read the book. The book was read by young people who grew up in the EU and educated in the EU Lithuania, and people who lived through the war, elderly people. The middle-aged people in Lithuania didn't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole because they, they live by the false, false um, narrative that the government has, has uh, manufactured. And uh, they, they can't, they can't uh, give up the lies and, and face the truth. So one of the problems that we face, to be perfectly honest, and I say this with a great amount of sorrow and uh, pain, is that one of the problems was that Israel never protested and never complained to the Lithuanians about the false narrative. And now I'm happy to say, two months ago, Dani Dayan, the new director of Yad Vashem, went and spoke on, uh, in the week of the Lithuanian Holocaust Memorial Day, spoke to the Semas, the Lithuanian parliament, and gave him hell. And he said exactly what, they, what he, they had to hear. You murdered the Jews. You destroyed one of the most beautiful communities, in, Jewish communities in the world. And you have to face the truth and tell the truth. And until you do that, you'll be damned. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, Naomi, if I am, welcome to New York. Um, I'm Melvin Bouquet. I've written some books, edited a few others, and several pertain to the Holocaust. One of these was read by Naomi Reagan, who contacted me in September and asked me to moderate this evening. It's now November, and we all know what happened between September and November and October. And in its own way has continued. I would make the case that anti-Semitism, which is a word I actually don't like, I think just saying anti-Jew is more appropriate, more accurate. In any case, that anti-Jewness has always been alive and that we were either too stupid or naive to perceive it, at least on American college campuses on one of which I teach until October 8th. Because of all of that, our conversation will and must be different than it would have been two months ago. Okay, I'm gonna try and stand up here very briefly and begin to engage in conversation, but a tiny bit more introduction is necessary. We have two authors here with two books which reflect off of each other in fascinating ways. It's always an injustice to summarize books, but like other injustices, it's inevitable. Ephraim Zoroff, as he told you, works for the Wiesenthal Center as a so-called Nazi hunter. I'm gonna, I, I wrote some of this before I heard them speak, so I'm probably going to reiterate a little bit, for which I apologize. He went to the, with Lithuania. He was accompanied by an open-minded Lithuanian woman, Ruta Vinagata. Their travels and conversations form the heart of our people. Enter Naomi Reagan. She said that she and Zoroff met accidentally a few years ago. Little did Zoroff know that his new friend would steal his life and provide him with a free sex change operation. In Ms. Reagan's novel, The Enemy Beside Me, a female Nazi hunter travels through Lithuania with a male Lithuanian who, like Vinigata, is willing to question everything the nation has said about its past. Um, I have questions for both of them. I was going to reiterate a few of the blunt, crude, horrific facts. 
they were mentioned, uh, the number of people, the percentage, the nature of the murderers. And one particular data point, which I would like to repeat, I had read 226 registered murder sites. Ephraim said there are 234, but 226 is registered. So it probably doesn't include minor places where only families were carted out and shot behind their homes. 226 in Lithuania. Lithuania is half the size of New York State. Okay, I'm going to sit down and we'll chat. Ephraim, there's a, a word that you use, a phrase that you use that's very significant. I don't think I'd heard it before, but the second I read it, I knew exactly what it meant. Holocaust distortion as opposed to Holocaust denial. Um, it seems many of the examples you used, uh, the elevation of murderers to heroes is pretty much a straight lie is denial. Distortion is more subtle. Distortion may even, may be less dangerous, but may be more insidious. Can you briefly elaborate? Okay, so Holocaust distortion is a situation in which a country or a person does not deny that the Holocaust took place. They acknowledge it, it took place, but changes the narrative. So first of all, I have to explain that Lithuania is not the only country in which this is prevalent. Every single post-communist um, new, dem new democracy, uh, there's a, there, are, there are efforts to change the narrative. And the reason is very simple. Those, in those countries, the Nazis were not the ones who did most of the killing. In countries like Poland, well, listen, let, let's put it this way. Think of, of, in Lithuania, there were less than a thousand Germans in Lithuania during, the, during World War II. You know the figures, 220, 12,000 were murdered. That's Lithuanian Jews. Thousands of Jews were murdered by the Lithuanians in Belarus. Several thousand Jews were sent from Central Europe to be murdered in Lithuania. And, how, and since the method of mass murder in Lithuania was not gas chambers, it was shooting. So in other words, it's very labor intensive. How could so few Nazis murder so many Jews? And the answer is very simple. The Lithuanians were avid, zealous collaborators. Same was true in, in Latvia, same was true in Estonia. In Croatia, the Ustasha, where the people were murdered Jews with, with zeal, and along with Serbs and Roma, okay? In, in countries like Romania, the Romanians sent soldiers and uh, units to, to Odessa to fight together with the Nazis. The Na they murdered tens of thousands of Jews in Odessa and other places. The Hungarians murdered Jews in Kamenets Podolsk, Jews whom they rounded up, who did not have Hungarian citizenship. In the Novi Sad, they murdered thousands of people in the city of Novi yes. Sad and, and all around. I had the privilege of bringing one of those officers to justice. Um, and uh, in what, in, when the Nazis installed a Arrow Cross government, Arrow Cross is the Hungarian fascists, so they went on, on a killing spree of the Jews that they could catch without the Yellow Star or po trying to pose as non-Jews. The word in Budapest was, it's not the blue Danube, it's the red Danube, full of Jewish okay. blood. Thank you. Yeah, I, think, I think that, uh, I think that the um, prime example of distortion, as far as the Holocaust is concerned, it, if I can just add this. I'm going to ask you about a different kind of distortion that will be a lot less comfortable. Okay. But just, just the whole idea that they want to equate what happened to them through the Soviets as being the same as it was. Um, when, so that, that's distortion. When the movie Schindler's List came out, uh, which I didn't see, um, but there was a showing for Holocaust survivors, and many people I knew attended it. And, uh, and uh, they came back, and they were very happy. They said, they made a movie about us. Um, and they said, you know, it was almost like that. 
and they almost drove me nuts. I think almost the closer an artistic rendering is to the actuality, the more it may impinge on the actuality. So Naomi, what I want to ask you is, um, you wrote a novel in which this kind of distortion is at the center. Doesn't fiction inevitably distort? I think that fiction sometimes can prevent, pre present a much truer picture than nonfiction. Not only doesn't it distort, but it can get to the heart of something the way a nonfiction book really can't. When you take two characters, as I have my two characters in my book, how are you going to you know, if I, if I would have taken the true story of what happened to you, you wouldn't get from it what I explain in my book happens to these two characters because when, when you use fiction as a way of reaching the heart of something, then what you do is you cut away all of the irrelevant details that you get in facts. And what you do is you carve in fine relief the absolute honesty and truth of a situation that you can't get with nonfiction. Nonfiction brings in this detail and that detail and that detail that has nothing to do with the heart of the story. But if you're God, which a author is, and you're creating characters and you're creating a story and you have in your head the absolute truth of the situation that you want to convey to a reader, then you have the opportunity to use your fictional creative powers to bring your reader into a story in a way that you can never do with nonfiction. So, so that is my answer. Okay. Um, this actually brings up a question I would have asked much, much later. The nature of truth and what it does for us. There's almost a very touching faith that if people know what is real, they will act differently. <laughs> that doesn't seem to be the world as I understand it. <laughs> what faith do you have? That, that, Either of you. That understanding the truth, they will act differently? This is what I believe. I believe if people had access to the truth, if people um, were not influenced by the big lie that they're influenced by now, you, you don't have any truth in the world anymore. Where, is, where are people getting the truth? There's no truth. You used to go to your television set and you would have you know, uh, some very um, establishment uh, person that would be sitting in a, you know, in a television studio, um, uh, Mr. Morrow, and everybody trusted him. They said, well, if he said it, and then you had newspapers where the newspapers of record, they called them, and they said, well, if it's, it's written in the newspaper, then you can trust that. Or if you see a photograph, you would say, oh, the photograph, you can see it with your own eyes. So, so now we're in a, in a world where nobody knows what the truth is. Nobody knows what the truth is. You can fake anything. You can, you can create a picture. You can take a picture from Syria and, and say, oh, this is what the Jews did to the Arabs in, in, in the West Bank. They do this all the time. So, and then you have people, my biggest problem is that, that the people that are influencing the young minds in this world on TikTok and on uh, uh, you know Twitter uh, X or whatever you want to call it, are idiots. They are ignorant. They don't know anything. And the people that they're leading are absorbing their ignorance, absorbing their hatred, absorbing the the stupidity, the boundless stupidity of these people, and you're creating a world in which people believe the worst lies and this influences them if we could somehow transform the world so that 
all the Palestinian children that are sitting in Gaza would somehow learn the truth about what happened in Israel and how Israel was established, how the Jewish people lived there for thousands of years, instead of getting the hateful lies that they're being educated in, in these UNRWA schools, then perhaps they would change. Perhaps they would. You want to address okay, I think that all, of, all of us realize that this is a cardinal problem based on what's happened in October 7th and the reactions to October 7th. And Israel has gone, has, has made tremendous efforts to collect the evidence, collect the clips uh, that were taken by the Hamas terrorists who, who were caught by, by, by the IDF and has tried to show it to the people who, who should know the truth. And I have to say that on a certain level, it's been a little bit disappointing because after watching these, these horrors, absolute barbaric crimes, not everyone comes away convinced that Israel must destroy Hamas. That actually connects with a, a line I wrote down from uh, Naomi's book in which some character says, someone has to pay. So the question is, um, do we believe in retribution? Absolutely. Who's we? Us on, Absolutely. The, us on the stage. I believe in retribution. I do too. I do too, but I thought I'd give you the opportunity um, to be less vitriolic. Um, okay, um, retribution, acknowledgement of truth. Um, is there any such thing as absolution? I think this begins to take us towards religion. What I want to know is a point that came up very briefly in both of your books, the nature of Christianity in Lithuania, um, and perhaps today, responsibility. Listen, I'll, I'll tell you one thing that uh, sometimes shocks people. In all the more than 40 years that I've been involved in, in facilitating the prosecution of Nazi war criminals, there hasn't been a single case of a single Nazi who ever expressed any remorse or regret. Never. Not long ago, a, a, a film was completed by a uh, British producer by the name of Luke Holland. It's called The Final Account. And he interviewed dozens of uh, elderly Germans, m many of whom served in either the Wehrmacht or the SS, etc. The movie came out about a year and a half ago, and what was fascinating to me was the fact that although there were several, a few people, not many, who indicated that they understood now that the Third Reich was a mistake, not a single one of them expressed any sympathy or empathy for the victims of the Nazis. Um, okay. Um... Ephraim, continue a little bit. You began a subject. You actually specifically referred to a study of perpetrators uh, within, the, within your book. What did you find out? There was a, a psychological uh, occupation, age. Um... What, what did I learn? <laughs> First of all, each country has its own nuances. The history of, of the Shoah is, is uh, not exactly the same in every single country. But if we look at Lithuania, we see, first of all, that the murders began even before the first Nazis uh, arrived in Lithuania. And part of that was, and most people don't know this, that the leaders of the Lithuanian political parties, okay, Lithuania became independent in 1918, in 1940, they were occupied by the Nazis, okay? During that year, the leaders of the Lithuanian political parties ran away from Lithuania to Berlin, where they were under the protection and aegis of one Heinrich Himmler. And they started sending messages into Lithuania that the day of reckoning is coming for the Jews and the results speak for themselves. In 42 different Jewish communities, there was physical attacks, including murder in some cases, on Jews by Lithuanians. Okay, um, Naomi, someone in your book says, why couldn't all of them, every last Jew, simply let it go? 
Uh, another character says, Jews shouldn't live in the past. Um, yeah. Why not? Yeah. A lot of people would love to do that. They would love to say, happened a long time ago. You have to give it up. You have to forget about it. But you can't. You can't forgive and forget until certain qualifications, certain, certain things are taken care of. Because the voices of our, of our dead are calling out to us. And they, they don't want to be in a mass grave that has no headstone. They don't want that their property was looted and, and their, you know, uh, their families don't get to use any of that. As long as there are crimes that are continuing in the present, we can't let bygones be bygones. And I, and I say in my book, there's a way to do this. I believe in reconciliation. I believe that there is hope. I believe from the story of Ruta and, and, and um, Ephraim that you can come to an understanding and you can put this in the past, but you can't do it if there isn't a sincere desire to make amends and if no steps are taken to make amends. Lithuania can make amends. They can start taking these 254 unmarked graves and mark them. They can start giving back the property they stole. They can admit first and foremost to their children to educate them and say, this is what happened in our town. This is what we did to our Jews. Until they do that, there can't be any reconciliation. You're also talking from their point of view. What I would say to that is, you know, um, Jews shouldn't live in the past? Of course we do. Passover, Purim, <laughs> Hanukkah. Right. What do we do except remember the past? Yeah, Thousands we, of years after the, the temple was destroyed, passing, right? and we right. still talk about it. You expect us to forget what happened 80 years ago? People are still alive? Forget it. Um, okay. Um, Listen, Melvin, one, one thing I'd like to say. Uh, sure. There are some initiatives in Lithuania uh, about, uh, about uh, commemorating, commemorating the, the Holocaust. But the interesting thing is that in none of these initiatives has anyone tried to publicize the names of the Lithuanian, the local Lithuanians who were involved in the killing. They're, they're willing to list the names of the victims. In Plungyan, for example, there is a monument. Plungyan is the town they spoke about in the, in the movie. There is a monument which lists many, not every single name, but many of the names of the victims of the Shoah, the Jews of, Plug of Plungyan, but not a word about their local killers. Okay, um, two more things. I'm gonna ask one more question, I'm gonna make one more point, ask one more question, then we'll take questions from the audience. Um, there's a kind of man mantra within the Holocaustal community uh, that goes something like, uh, that aims to be comfortable, that says, that aims to reconcile, that says, forgive but never forget. Actually, living in the midst of it, I would be very happy to wake up and forget. I would be very happy to wake up and know that it didn't happen. So my mantra would be more like, forget but never forgive. Um, okay, uh, one place we began a little bit with, we didn't go that far. Both of your books refer in different ways to the grotesque cowardice of academics and, uh, and bureaucrats um, in Israel, in Lithuania, and I can certainly attest that they exist in the United States. So I'd like to give you, ooh, I'd like to give you the opportunity uh, to take that an inch further. Listen, I'll tell you something. I, the worst day of my life as an Israeli citizen was when I was told by the Israeli ambassador, who was the first resident ambassador in Lithuania, uh, who asked me, why don't I stop doing what I'm doing? 
This is the Israeli ambassador, okay? As you can tell from my lovely Brooklyn accent, I wasn't born in Israel. I moved to Israel because I wanted to live in a Jewish country with Jewish priorities and, and, and help build up a, 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 the homeland. And this SOB, you'll excuse me, tells me that I should stop doing what I'm doing because I'm bothering him in a sense. I want to say one thing about that, and that is when I was studying about the history of what happened in Lithuania and it happened in Germany, it always started in universities. It always started with the professors and it always started the universities. The anti-Semitism came from academia and spread out to the people. And it's frightening to see what's happening today. So that's my take on it. Okay. Questions out there? There are something like 18 million Jews in the world and half of them are secular, atheists, whatever you want to call it. What was the effect of the Holocaust? Could you believe that there's a God, protector of Israel, the shield of Israel, the redeemer, with six million and the Holocaust? How did that affect Judaism in the world today? Can't, I, I'm not uh, qualified to answer the question. Um, I can answer uh, how uh, it affected. Um, so a bunch of Holocaust survivors are dead, and they're in heaven, and they're telling stories, and they're telling some jokes about the Holocaust. God walks by, listens, wrinkles his brows, and says, I don't think that's funny. And one of the survivors says, eh, you had to be there. That's what Judaism's become. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Cantor Dan Singer. I'm from another synagogue across town. Uh, and uh, I was actually involved in the film that uh, you showed at the beginning here. And I wanted to just uh, ask a question related to that. Um, uh, first of all, I deeply admire uh, your work, uh, Dr. Zeroff. Uh, and uh, I wanted to ask uh, if you think uh, that this film, which has won 136 awards, I believe, across the globe, uh, if that has made any impact at all, or if there are other things that we could do uh, today in light of the media war that's going on to make an impact as well. Okay. Um, it's, hard to, it's hard to say what impact the, the movie itself had, okay? Um, I know that our book, as I, as I explained, was read by certain um, age groups in, in Lithuania, but those age groups don't have the power, and they're not the ones who are making policy. I think that Danny Dayan's speech in the SEMAS, in the parliament, so far was the best blow that we could do to get the Lithuanians to change their, their tune. But, uh, Listen, we've been trying to get the statues and the honors that were given to perpetrators to get them removed in the middle of uh, Vilkomir uh, in, in, in Lithuania, in, in Ukmer, okay? There's a statue of Jozas Kristaponis, who is an officer in the battalion that was sent to Belarus where they murdered thousands and thousands of Jews. They were supposed to be removed, it's still there. And the same for the places like the school that was named for Nareka, even despite Sylvia Foti's book. Um, but the more that we can see of, the, of these initiatives, and the it, it, it has to come from the outside combined with people on the inside. Th this is the issue. In other words, it can't only come from people on the outside. I tried very hard to get, these, to get the Lithuanians to prosecute Nazi war criminals, no help from the inside. And you could tell by, by the attitude of the journalists, there wasn't a single journalist who specialized in Holocaust stories and who could be counted on to criticize the government for all the missteps that they were taking. Whereas in, in, in Croatia, believe it or not, we had journalists who were helping us and as a result, that was one of the reasons why Dinko Shakic, who was one of the commandants of Yesenovac, was brought, was extradited from Argentina, put on trial in Croatia, sentenced to the maximum sentence, and he died in prison. 
I can tell you one thing that would help, and that is if Jews would say no more uh, heritage tours to Lithuania until we solve this problem. I'm not going, I'm not taking my kids. You can talk about the Jerusalem of the East until your throat runs dry, we're not coming. You have to take some steps. You want Jews to come and visit you and, 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 and spend their hard-earned money, you do something to make us feel welcome. And the same thing is true of Poland, and I personally would never send my kids on one of those tours to Poland because I don't want the Poles to make two cents off Jews. Uh, they haven't changed. No. They, they, they're, they're absolutely not behaving the way they should. And I think that Jews have a lot of power that they're not using. And the power is an economic power. And you just have to say, I'm not going. Forget about your, your ad campaigns and your tourism board. We're not coming. That's my opinion. Excuse me for a second. I disagree. I disagree. I, I think it's a sad thing that, Jew, that Jewish high school kids have to go to Poland to, to, to strengthen their Jewish identity, okay? But that's a fact. And I know I spent 10 years in Miluim in reserve duty speaking about Nazi war criminals and the whole thing. And I was very pleasantly surprised by two things about Israeli soldiers. I spoke to the most intelligent, the most educated, to the least educated, and everything in between. And what made an impression on me was two things. One was that the knowledge of the students was far better than I expected, but also the empathy and the identification with the, vic with the victims and with the survivors was terrific. Absolutely terrific. And I asked myself, so how, how, did, how did this take place? And I, my answer was two things. One is that the Shoah became a subject for matriculation, for Bagrut in, in the high schools, and the trips to Poland. Those two things really did a very, helped do a very good job. By the way, most of the food and everything else is brought from Israel and the financial, financial input there is not that great, but I understand why you would say what you say. Hi, Dr. Zaroff. Uh, want to commend you. Really appreciate your work. Uh, my parents were survivors of the uh, Vilna ghetto and Stuttoff afterwards. But, I'd like, but I'm a member of YIVO, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Sure. And they continue to have this outreach and cultural expansion with Vilna, Vilnius, who was founded there. I could, I could see your body language there, but just curious on what you You're reading me right. <laughs> I'm against it. I mean, I, they, they had to butter up the Lithuanians to try and get what they wanted. So it's a question of what, what do you sacrifice and, and, and what do you do? In other words, what's your attitude towards a, a regime like this, the Lithuanians? And I mean, so far, nothing has changed in terms of the government. Same false narrative, same, you know, hero, you know, glorification of, of murderers, etc. What do you do? How do you, how do you relate to them? Uh, you know, that, that is the tool. Listen, that is the dominant theme. The dominant theme is those collaborators who murdered our relatives, who murdered our Jews, no, no uh, justice by the Lithuanians. The so by the way, the Soviets put many Nazi war, Lithuanian Nazi war criminals on trial, many. And that we also know a lot, as I, I'm talking to you as a historian, we know a lot about the, the details of the murders because of the trials by the Soviets of these, uh, of these uh, horrible people. Um, um, I think we're supposed to end pretty soon. Sir, I do want to address you with all respect. I think you got a tense wrong. You said Drew Vilna is the jewel. It was the jewel. And I think that's the essence of the difference. That's why we're here today. I'll also point out that Ephraim's response reminds me of a great line in his own book in which Ruta describes him as someone who ruins people's moods wherever he goes. Um, thank you for doing that. And uh, Naomi, maybe you can look forward to ruining some moods too. Thanks for being here. Thank you.